Fine. I think a little bit better at this mic. I think a little better. <laughs> can everybody see the screen? Yep. Yes. I can. Mighty. We can get rolling early today. So, um, so now we're on uh, John chapter 19. Father Rich says where we finish and at the bottom of uh, John 18 is Jesus going to trial. So we end it with, anybody remember how we end it? Do I need to go back and take this there? Mm -hmm. I think we ended when, when they were saying, you know, they didn't want, want to save Jesus. They wanted to, to have uh, Barabbas. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That is where we end it. So I had to go back and look this morning and I said, oh, okay. So because it doesn't have a title here, it just continued from 18. So we're still um, part of the trial. And um, and the last thing uh, that uh, Pilate did was ask them who they wanted to save. And, you know, Jesus and uh, or Barabbas. So we're going to pick up where we left off. Does somebody want to read? Uh, All right, don't jump out at once. Y'all don't know how y'all do. Everybody want to figure out which one. The print is really too small. Oh, wait a minute. The print is too small. Really? Okay. I don't know how to fix that. Let me see. Would that be the last time that, that happened? Um, give me a minute. Oh, I went all the way back to the beginning. Let me do that. Yeah. Now, did um, you try pinching out your screen? Oh, well, this is not a pinch. This is a computer. It's not like the. It's not like the. Uh, give me a minute here. I did something last time to make this go bigger. Let's see here. Yeah, you. I can pinch out my screen and see it. Can anyone else do it? I can see it. I don't have to do anything. Um, um, oh, wow, I did do it. Oh, now it's way big. Yeah, that's good. Isn't that too big? Oh. Y'all pinching now. I got to pinch back. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay, what do you... I didn't know I could pinch this screen. Let's see. How's that? Is that good enough or do I need to come large? That's large. That's fine. Is this better or should I do that's a little bit better. bigger? I think that's it's better. better. I can see it. Yeah. All right. So anybody wants to start? I can start. Lady, that'd be good. Um, then Polly took Jesus had him scourged and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Oh, uh -oh. I touched something. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, so now, you can't okay, now I got it going. Mm. See, now we're, we are anticipating what he said. <laughs> I just know it's a painful reading. That's, that's why I didn't, I didn't know. Okay. Mm. This, this, yeah, this is very painful. Okay, so it's, I don't have it on the screen at. Yeah, I kind of went up too far. I was trying to, went up too far, okay. Now, let's go back and do this again. Every time I move it up, it does this little jump thing. 
just doing this little jump thing on me. 20, okay. That's good. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, that's good. Is that, yeah. oh, yes, nope, it's gone back again. That's, yeah, that's good. good. Now, now you're in what's smaller than this. Okay. Okay, is that good? Um, one, one more, no. go one more higher. One more higher? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay. Are we ready? I'll, I can start over if you like. Yes. Start. Thank you. Okay. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests had the guards saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. Go ahead, we're gonna read this whole section. Okay. Um, Jesus answered, you would have- Wait, we, uh, are we on 10? Yeah, uh, the screen is moving, I can't. I'm sorry, question seven. Okay. <laughs> okay, the Jews answer, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate, consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Payment, in Hebrew, Kabatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. They cried out, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. All right, so, okay, we got to the Pilate, Pilate and his, his judgment, so. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Since we have actually heard this this last week, mm -hmm. yeah. My first thoughts jumps back at verse seven, right? Mm -hmm. There, it's like contradictory all the way through here, from seven on down, right? Remember last week we talked about um, the Jewish law versus the Roman law, and and right. uh, somebody had said how the, the Jewish authority turned it around, said Jesus was calling himself a king so that it would go against the Romans law, but at, at, mm -hmm. at, in order for the Romans to crucify him. So at verse seven, when, when Pilate told them, take him back yourself and crucify him, the Jews answered, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself 
the son of God, which they were calling the blasphemy, remember? Right. And then yeah. and then to turn it back around, he says, um, at verse 12, consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Now they're throwing it back to, he's mm -hmm. saying he, he's a king, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then coming down to uh, verse 15, I'm loving this. They cried out, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, remember, Father Rich said, pay attention to words. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you see the back and forth, you know, mm -hmm. at first they were saying he blasphemed, he's calling himself God. But in order for Pilate to, to execute him, he says, he's calling himself a king. Right. And now Pilate turned it back and said, shall I crucify your king? Because he don't want to do it. Right. Because he found no fault in him. So right. that, that's the yeah. play on words and the situation that I found interesting. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I think that, um, that Pollitt was really conflicted with showing his respect for Jewish law and showing his respect for Roman law, which was Caesar because Bef in the beginning, and that's what I thought, I thought he was showing respect for their law. But then as soon as the name Caesar came up, he flipped. So he was no longer conflicted there. Yeah. And then he offered yeah. up Barabbas. Um, you know, he, he, he had offered up Barabbas thinking that that would help him to solve the problem, but it never did. So in the end, you know, he handed him over to the Jews and, and they were going to crucify him, which, I mean, which they were going to do anyway. You, you yeah. know, uh, Garnetta and, and Michael, I completely agree with what both of you have said, because in this reading, I felt conflict from everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Pilate, you know, the Jews, I mean, it was just a, a whole message of conflict as sad and as hurtful as it is, because <clears throat> one thing that got me with Pilate, he kept saying, I find no fault in him, but then he took him and had him scourged and, you know, yeah. the room, and the cloak and the mocking and all of this other stuff, well, mocking is not in this, but, you know, we have an idea what happened with Jesus, but if you find no fault in him, why are you putting Jesus through all of these torturous things, yet you, you say you find no fault in him? And then you mm -hmm. kind of parade him out. And then <clears throat> there's a line, um, I can't see it right now, but where um, is being referred to as being afraid. He has this fear. Yes. I'm thinking, you this big bad, a uh, person, wh what is in this that is making you afraid in this yeah. situation? But the other thing that got me, was, and, and I've jumped over a couple of things that I still had thoughts about, but one thing that really got me, you, what you say, Michael, Father Rich said, pay attention to the words. There, uh, when the Jews said, where are we? Um, you are no friend of Caesar. Yeah. I, can't, I can't find it right now in the verse, but it's near the end. Friend, oh, here it is. Friend is capitalized. If you all notice that, 12. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Right. What more connotation that th does that lend to this conversation? Yeah. And in, in my phone, I checked it out. It said, friend of Caesar, a Roman honorific title <laughs> bestowed upon high ranking officials for merit. So it's like the Jews were threatening Caesar, I mean, threatening um, Pilate with this, reference to being a friend of Caesar. So there's a yeah. whole lot of conflict in this for me, the back yeah. and forth. 
Yes, I totally agree with everybody, with Michael Gar and Esther. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it's a powerful, they're powerful verses. And so what Michael was saying earlier um, about blasphemy, and that blasphemy uh, was the charge that the Sanhedrin used to justify his death. So, and, and as far as Pilate is concerned, he, um, Pilate just had another end in view by scourging Jesus. I don't think he would have, but that they were, he was pressured. So he did it to satisfy the Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So you think that he felt if he had literally beat Jesus up, that that would satisfy them? That would be enough, them? right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it wasn't. No, but he. They it wanted. Another, huh? They wanted that threat to them removed. The yeah. Jewish authority, you know, beaten yeah. wasn't wasn't enough. Right. You know, you notice they kept egging him on. And then they shouted out, crucify him, which means execute him, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. they wanted that threat eliminated. Beaten wasn't good enough, although they messed him up bad, but, you know. Right. You know, I was reading, I was reading um, about the Roman manner in which they, uh, which they scourge before crucifixion. And it says, and I'll read Roman as though it's good, um, that he would he was scourged in the in the Roman manner, which was much more severe than that of the Jews. And it talks about the Jews never gave more than 39 blows, for the law had absolutely forbidden a man to be abused or his flesh cut in this chastisement. Mm. It says that the common method of whipping or flogging in some places, especially that of a military kind, is a disgrace to the nation where it is done, where it is done to the laws and to humanity. And it says, although it was customary to scourge the person who was to be crucified, yet it appears that Pilate, of course, had another end in view. Um, so, and he hoped that this would have satisfied the Jews and that he might then have dismissed Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that appears in, in Luke and in Matthew. Thank you. I have something here also too that I think kind of explains uh, why Pilate did this and something about him fearing. It says these words pressured Pilate into allowing Jesus to be crucified. As Roman governor of the area, Pilate was expected to keep peace because Rome could not afford to keep large numbers of troops in the outer, outer line regions. They maintained control by crushing rebellions immediately with brute, brute force. Pilate was afraid that reports to seizure of the insurrection in his region would cost him his job. I, yeah, I, I agree. Life. Yeah. You know, when, we face, when we face a tough decision, we can take the easy way out or we can stand for what is right, regardless right. of the cost. If we know to do right and don't do it, it is a sin. But I was just trying to point out that he was trying to cover himself. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, you are and keep, and keep his, and keep his power. Mm -hmm. Um, you are to me hitting it right on the nose. Um, the play on words. Um, it sort of remind me of our Congress today. Each of them are saying things that benefit the other. Yes, it, and they throwing it back at each other. Um, just it's sort of like being on the floor of Congress, you know. So the. The Republicans will throw something at the uh, Democrats. Democrats throw something back at at the uh, Republicans, and it's you know it's the back and forth. And this is sort of like uh, you know like what Michael said, playing on words. But also, I, I do agree with uh, Esther that the scourging is a piece, to appease them, and maybe this will just kill it. You know, once we punish him with these lashes. 
Um, you know, maybe it'll be over with and I can get on with my life. But, you know, every time he moved, the um, the Jews would counter, did a counter move, you know, actually. And like you said, he really did not want to crucify uh, Jesus because he didn't find any fault. But um, as we can see, it looks like um, the Jews continued pushing him until they thought he um, made a fault against um, Caesar. And that was the only thing that kind of made him move. Mm -hmm. now, and uh, looking at uh, verse eight, and uh, you read about him being afraid. Um, being afraid. Yes, his job was to, um, you know, to keep the, keep the peace. <laughs> East in that region, exactly. And and if someone else came in, he would have lost his job. But also, um, I think he was still, I think he was still afraid to do a thing because deep down, I think, and I read somewhere in Pilate, he kind of believed that Jesus was a holy man. And um, whether he got that from John the Baptist or whatever, he believed, I think he believed that he was a a holy man, but it doesn't say here. I don't think it's written anywhere that says that he believed that. But the way, at the beginning, the way he was um, questioning him, he heard all the things that he did, and he really wanted to see some of these miracles that didn't that Jesus didn't do for him. But I think that he that was too a part of his fear. But it's again coming back to today. I think still that people are. Um, that's wrong with our Congress today. They won't go against uh, their leadership, and I mentioned no name, their leadership, yeah. because they're afraid of losing their jobs. Yes. And they pray yeah. that when come voting time, their backers won't back them if they go against uh, this person. That's good. <laughs> exactly. I have a, and in another the case theme. of the two mm -hmm. Justins, it backfired on them. And, and, <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say it something back, real quick backfired. about the, um, I don't know what verse it was in, about when he was scourged and he was, and they cloaked him in purple. Yes, mm -hmm. that's near the yeah. beginning. I, I, I went to, I wasn't able to attend St. Bernadine's, but I went to Our Lady of Hope church a catholic church on easter sunday and every statue in there was cloaked in purple and i don't know if anyone has ever experienced that before and thinking about this verse but it was a very powerful feeling to walk in there and see no statue revealed every um every statue in there was cloaked in purple cloth yeah we used to see i used to see that in the catholic church i think this year on easter house was cloaked in white wasn't it yes it was cloaked in white yeah um, yeah they uh a lot of i've seen a lot of crosses cloaked in purple um, mm -hmm. uh, before but it wasn't even the cross cloaked in purple the cross was the only one revealed but every statue <laughs> in the church was cloaked in purple Oh, wow. Every single one of them. I've never seen that one before. Uh, is it I, I, me either. But I tell you, it was a feeling that just went down your spine thinking about this verse uh, sitting there. Can I, can I highlight verse 30? I found a, another cutesyism by John, if I can say it that way. Would so, you call it, Michael? A, a cutesy, you know, if I were to say John be sneaking stuff in there symbolism <laughs> right and we go right by he ain't slipped this one by me so can i set it which, up this way verse is it looking at it's actually verse 13 but i'm gonna start at verse 10 i'm trying to set it up if this makes sense when Pilate says do you not speak to me do you not know that i have power to release you and i have power to crucify you mm -hmm. jesus answered him you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above for this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. So he's letting him know, you really don't have no power over me. Right. Here, goes the, here goes the cutesyism, verse 13. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out 
and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. The key sentence here is, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench. Now, let me read you the footnote. It says, uh, seated him. Others translate, Pilate sat down. In John's thought, Jesus is the real judge of the world, and John may be here, may be here, John may here be portraying him seated on the judgment bench. So who's the real judge here, huh? Wow. That's that little wow. kiss wow. John that's stuck in there, huh? Yes. Jesus is sitting yes. on the judgment seat, right? Yes. Oh I said, you ain't slipping that one by me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Does that make Lord. sense, though? Yes. Yes, Lord. <laughs> I thought about that. I said, why would he see him on the judge's bench? There's that play on words again. But there I you mean, go. there you go. Mm -hmm. but, and, was and he, it, but he was also, was he, I, I feel like he was also calling Pilate a sinner. And because in verse 11, he said, You're handing uh, me over to you as the greater sinner, the person, I'm thinking he's talking, referring to Judas there, but he's yeah. also telling Pilate that he's a sinner. It's not that the and one that handed him over is the sinner, he has the greater sin. So I really think that shook Pilate up. But I don't think that was Pilate either. I, I, I think that went back, because uh, I think that went back to Judas also. Mm -hmm. I think that, okay, so who are you seeing that handed him over? It was it, it, it was it was Pilate. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm, I'm talking I about no, I don't think so. I mean, when you think about it, I think that it, it wouldn't have been no handover if Pilate hadn't uh did it. It wouldn't have been a handover. Um so you got to um, unmute yourself, Garnett. I don't mute you by mistake. Um, I'm sorry. I wasn't taking that literally as somebody passing you from hand to hand. I was taking that as someone who was responsible for me being here in the first place. And that was Judas. That was Judas. I knew you. That was Judas. And uh, yes, yeah, he, uh, he set this whole, well, him and the Pharisees kind of set this whole scenario up. I can't leave him by himself because right, absolutely. But, but uh, you know, we people come to you all the time with um, with different choices, and you have to make a choice whether you want to go along with the group or not. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, Judas had a choice, and you know, the choice was you know to stay true to um, Jesus or to betray him. And, uh, you know, he decided that somewhere deep inside of him, even though he, you know, even though he walked with Jesus, and, I, you know, I think people are still trying to understand who Judas was, as, you know, who he was as a person. This person who walked beside Jesus every day, along with the rest of them, saw the miracles that he did, but somehow he just he just couldn't seem to wrap his head around uh, that he was the um, he, he was the son of God. You know, even though he's seen this, and it is it, it's sort of like today. You know, um, <laughs> you can't believe your own eyes today. You, people got cameras, they got everything. You see stuff, and all of a sudden, it is not your reality. Mm. So even though he was seeing it in his mind, it was not his reality. To I think don't don't quote me on this. I'm thinking that in his mind, even though he walked with him, talked with him, in his heart, I think he was just trying to grapple with who this man was, and he couldn't. And when they came to him, and you know how uh, you know how to say the devil is a liar is what they say. They, he knows also our weak points. And especially when we in the sense of doubt, when there is doubt in our hearts and our minds about something that shouldn't be uh, obvious, we struggle with it. Hmm. 
You, you speaking of Judas, um, D? Yeah. Okay. I am. I, I think that only because of that sentence that uh, Jesus said that we have here that the one he um, had that was verse 11, I think. Yeah, has the greatest sin. Yes. Yes. So that's where I am, you know, even though he walked with him every day, ate with him, they laughed, slept together, you know, you think you know a person, but he still struggled with, you know, mm -hmm. but I think with, and, you know, I'm, just, I'm trying to bring it in in my own perspective, you know, not, I read something or whatever. I'm trying to figure this out, you know, too, that the one who handed over, handed me over to you has the greatest sin. The greater sin. And, and you know what, D, I'm, I'm following you because as you were talking, I thought about today and Judas was the, the money keeper and somewhere in scripture talks about his greed, you know, handing uh, Jesus over for those 30 pieces of silver. Look at what we are dealing with right now. The, these highly, these billionaire money backers of the Republicans and these uh, politicians who, and going back even in scripture, who are afraid of losing their jobs because they won't have these billionaires backing them uh, to run for the next election so they can keep their jobs. But it's the same kind of principle. Because, and, and Justice Thomas right now, all of the money he's been receiving, all these transactions with this billionaire who's been supporting him, now I don't even know if he's on a hot seat because too many Republicans are, you know, have control of the House right now. But it's the same kind of principle, greed overtaking common sense. I mean, I look at the politicians now and people and the, the Trump, I call them a cult. They can't see truth. There's no, they, they, I mean, you see these things happening every single day that lead you to the truth. And they still want to invest in their conspiracies and their lies. And they're public about it. I mean, yeah. they're trying to hide these falsehoods, you know, and that's why there's one part of the scripture, I think it's in here, about, oh, yeah, when, when Pilate asked, what is the truth? It, it's in the previous uh, scripture of John. And I'm going like, here we go, right back. And Father preached on this power and truth. These people are so caught up in the power and the greed and all of the things that they don't want to lose, that they lose sight of the truth. Yes, and, and then know, many of them, them, Esther, I agree, and many of them, if you ask them, or sometimes you even hear them make a statement, I believe in God. They say, mm -hmm. I believe in God, and it's just so hypocritical yes. that, that they have this... Um, what do you call it? They they have this loyalty to, I would say, like I'll put Caesar in quotation marks, take Caesar out and they have this loyalty to power. They right. have this loyalty to money. They have this loyalty to friends. And um, they have this loyalty to these things over here on the left. And it just confirms their rejection of God but yet they say they believe in God. So it's yeah. just, uh, it's a, a really mixed up world that we have here. We're in it. And so just like Father Rich said in church, I think it was last Sunday, we got to face it head on and do what we can to help in, in many regards. Yeah. But it, it's just so powerful, you know, um, like I thought about Trump and Mike Pence. Mike Pence didn't do anything wrong, but but uh, Trump was gonna have him crucified, right? Right. You know, just as just as just so he could keep the power, just so he wouldn't have any fear of losing his job. He was willing to have somebody who <laughs> walked next to him on a daily basis crucified. That just blows me away. Yeah, that's a good analogy. And in talking about truth, I mean, what's going on today, what recently happened between Fox and Dominion, I mean, 
people literally knew that they were lying and lying to the public. So what, what do we see as a result of all that lying is all that collateral damage where people are losing their lives, losing their families in prison and everything else. But the truth was on Dominion's side. So who won? I mean, truth to me always wins. And like uh, Father Rich said, we have a choice. You know, we are given a choice. We can choose a son of a father, you know, or a son of a true father. That's our choice. And so Fox made his bed and now it has to let lie in it. But truth always, always takes over lives. Yeah, God is always on time. I'm uh, tell you, it might take a while, but it could take a while. Yeah, but He shows you who He is. Hmm. I had a, uh, I saw an interesting reflection going going back to um, Jesus's words, saying, "For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin." And we were talking mm -hmm. about Judas. Mm -hmm. um, it was about the money. With Judas and so the reflection that that this was in Catholic daily reflections and they made a comparison between Judas and Peter and it was saying how how Peter denied Jesus and Judas betrayed him right. and so when I'm looking at this the one who turned me over to you has the greater sin Judas's betrayal ate away at him to the point that he killed himself. Suicide. Peter, after denying Jesus, that ate at him too, knowing that he denied him. But the reflection said that Peter went back to the community of disciples and they received him back. And eventually he got over that, right? But then we know the story of Peter. Peter was the rock but they were showing you the differences of Judas instead of going back to the community once he was condemned with this, uh, the betrayal, he separated himself and then look at the end result where Peter went back. Even though he felt bad about what he did, they received him back and Peter became the rock of the church. That's all I wanted to share. Well, Thank you for sharing that because to all of us, um, we always have an opportunity. D, if you were saying something, you were muted. Try and make it right. <laughs> I was just saying that was a good point that you made. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and and uh, it made me think about the, the two men. Um, and think about us, and, you know, whoever that we have betrayed. And when you do that, you, you have to go back to the person. You have to go back to the community and atone for your sin. And so, um, and it does eat at you uh, eventually. It, it, it's a sin that, and you know when you betray someone. It, you know when you don't turn someone in. It's, it definitely is going, and you keep it to yourself a lot of times. If, you know, if you know you don't trade, betrayed someone, um, it could be a, a could it could be a something about that person that you weren't supposed to tell, and you told it to somebody else, and it got out. And you know that it eats at you when you do that. And you made a good point, Judas. I think maybe you say maybe it's still about choice. He had a choice that he could have gone back, just like Peter did, to the community and and beg for forgiveness and atone for his, you know, to atone for his sin. But he went out and, like you said, separated himself and committed a, a greater sin by taking his own life. And, mm -hmm. and, and knowing, that's what I said earlier, that he was still convicted about who Jesus was. And, and you think about it, and you mentioned it was about the money. I, I don't think it was about the money. This is me. Because at the end, you know, he threw the money back at him because he was conflicted. This is something, you know, it's sort of like uh, your DNA, where people act. 
you know, this is something you normally do, and they think that's what he wants, and say, okay, if you betray him, I'll give you normally, you know, this is what you usually do, you usually take money. And the keep face, some people will do the same thing they always done, even though they know it's not right, and that's not what they really want to do now. So I think he was trying to keep his um, his reputation that he, you know, that he was a money grabber all the time. But I'm just here to believe that that man was conflicted and conflicted meaning that I'm walking beside this person and I can't believe this person can be that good. A lot of people do that when they walk uh, uh, around, they so used to a certain environment. So when they, they get a person that always does the right thing, it's confusing. And mm -hmm. you know, no one's taught them and we got that out here in the world with our children. No one's taught these children how to behave, how to conflict resolution, you know, how to deal with um, loss, how to deal with betrayal. When they are betrayed, we know what happens. What happens when they betray? They go get a gun and they start mm -hmm. shooting each other. They mm -hmm. are internally conflicted. And I believe that's what, I just still believe that's what happened uh, to Judas. And instead of, um, I think that he, he, he was, it was never taught that you could go to somebody else and, at, and they can show you how to move on from this. Because at, at times we all, whether we told <laughs> coming up, if we told our brothers and sisters when we was children, who do we go to when we know we did something wrong? And that shows you how powerful the influence of the devil is, though, right? Because mm -hmm. Judas walked with them for a while. He right. saw the things that Jesus did. But in spite of that, that power or that influence of the devil came upon him so strong that he went on with his little plot, right? And, and so, again, that shows you what we're up against as mm -hmm. believers of Christ, that this this dark force that's out there, right? We talk about the truth. We had to keep standing up to fight back, right? In Judas's case, he gave into that, that darkness and went, along with, went on with his plan. So I think once he realized, I guess, I think you used the word conflicted. Yes, I did. Yeah, because it, you can kind of see how how he just bounced back and forth. One minute he was with Jesus, the power of, of the right. darkness came upon him. He went on with the plan, but then afterwards, it's like, I don't know if I should have done this. I'm just saying, I don't know if right. I should have done this. And it weighed so heavily on him that in his confliction, he decided to take his life. Exactly. You know? But that's the force that, that we're up against. And we should not take the devil and the dark force for granted. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I, I think um, it's the sin, I think, that eats at you is it's here. Um, I, even I, I was thinking all the way back from the beginning, all the way back from the beginning, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, mm. you know, all the way back to the beginning, Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam, no, you, the, they weren't supposed to touch that tree. And so it's like, uh, you know, you're not supposed to steal, but you steal anyway. And after you do that, there is an overwhelming guilt and a, a sense of being afraid that somebody's gonna catch you in your sin. It's sin is a fear of being caught also. And it, and it's sort of like Adam and Eve knew they weren't supposed to touch a tree, and they did. And then once they did, they started to dress themselves and hide. What, why were they hiding? What made them hide? You see what I'm saying? What made them hide? It was the guilt over the sin that they were going to be caught. You know, mm -hmm. they were afraid they was going to be caught. But they were deceived by that demon spirit or the serpent, which represents that that demon, that devil, right? And and the fruit that they took upon gave them the knowledge to say, "Hey, I am naked. Let me cover myself." 
when before before they were deceived, they were just two people, right? I'm just trying to put it plainly, but yes. you know, that's how God made them, you know, but until they were deceived, well, at least she was deceived by the serpent. That's where that sin entered in. And then he went along with the sin, but mm -hmm. you feel that Satan, it, when we open that door to um, listening and getting conflicted with that, because they always do a cartoon with the devil's on one shoulder and, and the angels on the other shoulder. That's, that's an area of conflict that we are really conflicting. We don't know whether to believe the truth or to believe a lie. It's sort of what people go into today. They don't know whether to believe the truth or they don't know whether to believe a lie. And sort of they don't want to open themselves up to see the truth. And it, exactly as you were saying, Michael, and Satan comes in and gets us at our weakest point, at, at our weakest point. And I think that's why uh, this passage for us in 11 is so powerful. For this reason, the one who handled me over you has the greatest sin. This man, I think, was so conflicted that he just didn't even know how to go back to the other disciples and ask forgiveness cry on the shoulder and ask for help. I know, and I probably think Peter did all of that. And, and you know, what happens when somebody betrays you? They also got to win your trust back. So I'm, I'm yeah. sure Peter had to do that with the rest of the crew. But do you really think that he had to do that much? Because where were the rest of the, the uh, uh, disciples at that particular time? They don't even mention them. What, what happened to them? Were they... All of them weren't at the foot of the cross. I think they said some of them scattered after, yeah. after you know, after they arrested Jesus and they were saying what, what they was doing. But to add up, to sum up all, all everything you said, D, it comes down to choice. You know what I mean? The choice that we make, yes. even in our confliction, right? right? Mm -hmm. It's the choice that we make, you know? Yeah. But I was going to say too that the uh, that the um, that the apostles scattered, but eventually they were all they all died, were crucified or were stoned or skinned or something because of their faith. Right. Eventually, because of their faith. Right. Yeah. And remember, they said for fear of the Jews, right? That you know they scattered, they hid you know, because these were the guys that actually walked with Jesus, who was the sort of enemy to the Jewish authority. Right. You know? So um, they were definitely going to look for them. Can, can I add something uh, that I, and, and Michael, I think this prompted, was prompted by me when I heard you say how the devil is busy, Satan is busy, you know, we can't take uh, the devil for granted. Uh, and uh, give me a minute because I want to read something. I get um, I get a publication from the Sulpician Fathers, um, an update, um, and their nearest provincial's name is Father Moore, Daniel Moore. Um, many of you may know of St. Mary's uh, Spiritual Center. Well, that that was all started by the Sulpician Fathers. But he um, was talking, uh, he's an older guy, but he said when he first entered the seminary, he was talking about his fellow seminarians and how he felt that they weren't as devout and um, he noticed this lack of charity and all these things that were going on with him, him looking at his fellow seminarians. So when he talked to his mentor, and this is a direct quote, um, he said, a lack of charity that I harbored within my heart then relating this to my spiritual director, he smiled, perhaps it was a grimace, and shared with me a bit of wisdom. This is what hit me. His mentor said, the holy are not spared temptation. He affirmed what I had experienced. Evil lurks within holy places, seeking its greatest triumph, those striving to become holy, such was and is my experience. So Michael, when you said that, I thought about this. I said, the devil is busy 
intent on destroying everything God has created. And his greatest triumph is when he goes up, and I think about when we have our Bible study. I know he all up in here trying to do whatever, <laughs> probably, you know? Yeah. yeah, reading the words, doing all kinds of stuff. And in our lives and in the church, and I think about all the things that have happened within the church, he's trying to go into the, that's his greatest triumph when he gets holy people to act unholy. I went mm -hmm. like, dang. Exactly. And mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like, you're right. And the world is watching. Yes. The world is watching. And you know that from your own experiences living within your families. If you're the person that always go to church, always pray for everybody, they are watching you. Yes. So that, you know, if you fall, they will say, oh, okay. It, you know, I do that church of going, doing that stuff wasn't that good anyway. Yeah. Yes. Remember that, that we are the ones that are supposed to be set apart and setting the tone, right? Jesus set the Israelites apart and said, I'm going to make a holy nation of you, right? People are going to see that you serve a mighty God. You're different from them. So, so what more nemesis for the devil than to destroy that? Because he's, he's the opposite, right? So the, the holy, the holy, I think you said holy, holy people, Esther, yes. that, yeah. that is for what we represent, right? We're the tone setters. We're the model makers. So I have to destroy that tone setter, that leadership, that model maker in order to empower me, devil, right? So, 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 you know, people will look at the Christian as the example on one hand and said, you're the, you're the holier than thou, right? But we're people. But right. they expect you yeah. to walk perfectly. Nobody's perfect except Jesus. Right. And it's just right. funny how even today, once you say I'm a Christian, people look at you like you're supposed to be that perfect person. You're not supposed to do anything wrong, but that just shows you their lack of understanding. Sometimes we have a lack of understanding because sometimes we strive to be that. And in our minds, we think that once I was baptized or I'm, I'm saying I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior that magically, magically I'm going to be perfect, but right. we're real people. And so Father Rich always tell us sometimes we ain't going to understand things, but keep on walking, Just keep right? Walking. Keep on walking. But, but I think that's one of the biggest conflicts we have with people. You know, they, you say, oh, he's he's a he's a christian you know they want to put the microscope on you the magnifying glass you know mm -hmm. i have no problem with that because i know the god i serve if i slip up you know i can confess my sin right. and ask god to forgive me and keep on walking but yeah. that person looking at you will look at you and think you should be condemned to hell for what you just did or said or whatever so anyway yeah, yeah. yeah. i was thinking um, of the word uh, conscience. And I, I honestly, I'm 69 years old and just- Laura Retta, you are not supposed to tell our age. Oh, well, Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> well, look well, at you, you, beautiful. Well, you thank you. <laughs> Would you say, Michael, repeat that, you, Michael? You, she has to remember that everything that pertains to her pertains to me. So she has to be careful about what she says. And I don't appreciate it. Oh, since, since I love you. Well, me look dearly. at the beautiful both of you. How about that? Uh, thank you, Michael. I'll take that compliment. But you know, I back uh, oh, to what I'm back mercy. to, you know, I'm an elderly person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're still at it. <laughs> but that I just thought about today, the word conscience <laughs> has the word science in it. Have we ever thought about that before? Mm -hmm. How you spell conscience? C-O-N-S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, right? No. <laughs> How you spell it? 
God, seriously now, stop. <laughs> I'm so upset about my age, I can't get past it, but I'm going to ask God you forgive me for that. That's correct. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the word science is in it, right? So no, it's C O N S C I O U S to be serious. Go on, Netta. That's how you, yeah, C O N S C I O U S. That's conscious. That's conscious. Your sister said conscience. I said conscience. What is, what is, <laughs> that's why. That I, I can't now, get my mind straight after your you age is my... revealing your your. <laughs> but anyhow, what, oh, you. I see, I see where you're. That's conscious. I'm thinking that okay, conscious. You thinking it's, conscious? Okay, you, you're talking about right or wrong, making a decision in your mind about what's right or wrong. Okay, yeah, my like um, guilty yeah. conscience. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, like <laughs> I'm gonna get through my statement. <laughs> I just can't. I can't even spell right. I'm so upset. Like, uh, okay. but anyhow, that... <laughs> I sister, I gotta mute you. I'm myself on mute because I'm laughing too hard. <laughs> oh God. Uh, so now I have muted everyone so that we can re, uh, we can move on just a little bit um, to get down to some of the, we're not going to finish this whole chapter, but just to read from the crucifixion of Jesus on what happened next. So does anybody want to um, take up um, where Loretta left off or Loretta, you want to continue? Or? Yeah, I'll think, uh, let, me, let me try to get my statement out. But what I was thinking back to what I was saying, I was thinking that the word conscience had the word science in it. And I didn't think about that. Um, so when we talk about the devil, we would all the things that you guys were saying, I agree with. And and so it's thinking about um or having the knowledge what is of what is right or wrong. So to me, it it really is. And I'm sure, at least I have uh, in my lifetime, I'm sure you guys have too. I think it's in some ways a tragedy when a person succumbs to um, those evil pressures. And right, it is. And, and then, you know, to, to those pressures, and it does that which is a, a violation of your own conscience. And when I mm -hmm. thought of it that way, and then that's when I said, well, your conscience is like looking at a science. It is a science. So that's how um, I was thinking about it. And it's just amazing to me, like the crucifixion of Christ with all the things that we were talking about, that crucifixion was preordained. And then everything that we do, I think in life, I feel that it's preordained. So if I leave here, my home today, and um, whatever happens in my life is preordained, I just have to have the good conscience to have the knowledge to remember what I was taught that was right. And if I do that, then I will live in the truth. Okay. So that's all I had to say. Now, now you make me have to go back and respond to that. Okay, um, when I was teaching religion at, at St. Bernings, one of the things I did tell my students that whether someone told you or not, God had put in us an innate feeling that tells us what's right or wrong. It's something within us that God has already put there that tells us it's wrong. Let me go back again. Even though Eve didn't hear it from God, not to touch that tree, she heard it from her husband, but she knew in her gut that that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And God has given us that feeling up front to know, you know, what's right and, you know, and what's wrong. And the other thing is, if everything, uh, Father Rich said this, and, and I'm trying to quote him, I can't. But anyway, 
I'm going to sum up what I think he said, is that in Esther 2, she always comes back and says it's about choice. And to say that our lives are preordained is saying that God is not giving us a choice. Now, he might have a plan for our life, but there is still a choice in it. And he uses that uh, Jesus being handed over. He's saying that Jesus didn't come to die. He came to, for our salvation. Now, if he could do that without dying, then that was the plan. But it didn't go that way because he dealt with human beings who have a choice. We have a choice. And if it's preordained, then our choice is we get to the fork of the road and it's up to us to make the right or the left. Judas got to the fork in the road where he made a choice. And the choice was to tell those people who called him in to betray Jesus to go, <laughs> go to, <laughs> but he didn't. He said, I am going to, I'm going to do your bidding and hand this man over. So, you know, when every time I hear that about Jesus came to die, it just makes me go back and think, I'm not saying Father Rich is right. I'm like saying everybody is saying he's, and he is our, uh, our spiritual leader, but he is still uh, going through these steps to two with us. Every day we live, we are learning from the God who wants us to be near him again one day. So I, I, I just wanted to add that preordained doesn't mean, I think is God has a plan. And there are two different things. And when we get to that plan, you know, are we following God's plan or do we decide, I don't want to follow God's plan? And now, Excellent analogy, D. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I'm just yeah. trying to get to this. I, I, yeah. I was thinking, I thought yeah, we were with that. And, and you're right, Dee, what Father Rich said, because I made a note in my phone, free will, because if we don't have free will, it, it puts restraints on God. We, yes. we, can't, we can't put restraints on God and say, okay, God has no control over this. We know he does, but he gave us free will. And that's the, that's the biggie that you were talking about. So we have choices. And, and you always say that. And, you know, you make sure that we hear that and God gave us uh, free will and, and, and the choice. And the choice is that, you know, we get to that or do we choose God or what he says, or do we go our own way? And we have that every single day when everyone has that choice to listen to the rhetoric out there, but listen to what God is calling us to do. So mm -hmm. um, somebody mentioned, uh, was it, I forgot, about being religious. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many Christians out there who believe the Trump lie. They will say they are Christians. They go to church every Sunday, just like we do. They belong to the Catholic Church. They belong to the Southern Baptist Church. They belong to the Methodist congregation. They belong to some church that follows Christ. And they still believe the lie that Trump told them because they have a choice. Their right. choice is that, uh, it's so sort of like to me, they worship an idol. It's like being an idol worshiper. And you know, they always talk about Catholics being idol worshipers and I be quite in that part, but people worship people like they are idols, like they the Pharaoh. And that's what I think they are doing with this Donald Trump thing. That's, that's just my take on that. And they well, think I it makes it look phone. good when it's they hide behind religion, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Remember, I said we're really we the religious. God has told them this. That God has told them this. And right. Jesus didn't say it here in this book. And God didn't tell them. <laughs> he didn't, but, he didn't but tell But that's them. Being, being turned over to, to their, what, what was that word? De depraved mind or however they said it, it says you know when when you're out there touting i'm evangelical i'm this and i'm that and you're saying the truth as you see it which could be the biggest lie but like like you said god puts in us right what's right 
and and they know because if if they would go back to the word of God, but then it would come down to a matter of interpretation. But I'll just I'll just say it this way: as long as you know what the truth is, right? And God say, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." Right. Look at the model that He sent. But some of us are just so way out there, you know. We follow in the crowd. And the crowd could be leading us to hell, but it sounds good and it feels good. And I think Father Rich said this last week is from where we sit in that, we might see something in a certain way, right? But does that necessarily mean that, that it's the right way or the truth? Right. right, right. Yeah, you know what? And that saying I kind of live by, uh, Sister Annette told me about that. She said, you see from where you stand. You see from where you stand. It goes back to the truth last week about right. the truth. And that, I, but I, I, I just want to end on this note again, um, Loretta, is that to be ordained, I mean, you know. Preordained. Preordained. See, when I, when I was thinking of preordained, I was thinking of. Let me finish. Um, go ahead. God, it makes it like God doesn't trust us to choose him it, it makes it like he doesn't trust us to choose him and that's why he gave us choice he wants us to love him freely and if he preordains and sometimes i want him to you're right sometimes i wish he'd just tell me what to do but he he doesn't tell us what to do and i used to tell my kids god will lead you into his path he will close doors he will put people in front of you he will put obstacles and so you won't go that path and guess what you insist on going that path he said well go ahead he said well go ahead but i don't stop you from every corner that i can it's sort of like that joke they tell about the boat the car <laughs> and, and god said god why did you save me and he said everything you could possibly do and the man still wanted to drown god said, well, drown <laughs> When I when I I understand I understand uh, what you were saying about your free will and making choices, and um, I remember um, Father Rich telling us about that. When I was thinking of preordained, if you look at um, Ephesians in the first chapter of Ephesians, um, it says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, yeah. even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, right. that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined. We should. Pre he predestined us. Now, Mike Michael, man, what's that word, should be? You said, uh, said should be. In love, he predestined us. Not should be. He predestined us. Predestined means to, to me is preordained. He loved, I um, mean, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself. His sons through Jesus Christ. And you're right. According to the purpose of his will. And then then but he still gave us choice. He made it, he put in us. He could not make us without putting some of him in us. You understand? All of us are part of God. But that's the part I'm talking about. That's, pre, that's the part I'm talking about that's preordained, what you just said. All of us. Do you there. see what I mean? What he put in us, all of that was preordained. All is what of I'm us saying. are, uh, have the love of God. That's what we call it. The love yeah. of God within us. The love right. to do the right thing. But then he put a little carrot in there. It's in you, but you just got to use it. That's it's right. Like, it's like we tell our kids in school, you got it up here, you just got to use it. And we yeah. got it in here, but we just have to use it. And sometimes we just don't. And sometimes it's just easier not to. And sometimes we're so darn mad at somebody else. I'm so mad at Michael that I ain't going to forgive him today. Even though it's nobody sick. can be mad at Michael, but go go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> no. but I, 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 I agree. 
I have it in me to love him, to forgive him. Just like you said about, Michael said about Peter. They had it in them to forgive Judas. And remember, I have one more thing to say before we close. You remember with, on um, Holy Thursday, when we was washing the feet. And remember Father Richard's sermon? Didn't he say with Jesus, Jesus washed Judas' feet, even though he knew he was going to betray him? Yes. Yep. It is in us. That love of God is in us. No yeah. matter what, it's in us. Did Jesus cry when Lazarus died? Of course he did. Not just because he missed his friend. He cried because we betrayed him. They betrayed all the stuff that I've shown you. You still don't believe who I am? Betrayed. He forgave us. Isn't that the, like the song said at the beginning of our, how marvelous is that he did, he did for us. How yeah. marvelous. Isn't that right, Kathleen? Oh, yeah. Uh, real bad. Marvelous. Bro. Yes. Amen. Y'all did a that's, great job today. Yeah, but Two minutes. That's, right. I'm sorry, go ahead. And I'm going to take this off of um, the cord right now. And then, Michael, you can uh, continue to go with Whatever. <laughs> no, I was just saying that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Stop the recording. Okay. It'd be good if I can find what I put my button. Okay. Recording stopped sitting right in front of me.